Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Entrepreneurial Podcast with your host, Jeff Lopes. Jeff has over two decades experience as a serial entrepreneur, building brands like KimuraWare from his home basement to a multi-million dollar global brand that has sold over a quarter million pairs of boxing gloves. Jeff's here to educate, guide, and drive you on the process of bringing your ideas and dreams to reality with the inspiring stories from some of the top business minds. Welcome to episode 138 of the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lope. Super excited to have on today Kevin Makeley. Kevin is a martial artist, an actor, an athlete, an entrepreneur, so many layers but one of my favorite, he plays Randy Macho Man Savage on The Young Rock. Great conversation, tons of value, tons of fun. Sit back, everyone, and enjoy. We are live, we are live in the Jeff Nozine Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today, Kevin Makeley. What is up, brother? Ah, uh, man, you know, living a dream, brother, living the dream. This Happy is to be on with you. <laughs> We, we tried to do this recording a week ago. Uh, we had some technical difficulty. Uh, Kevin is an incredible, I want to say storyteller, just the way you go with your stories is, this is going to be a fun, entertaining conversation today. So I'm super, super excited. Let's yeah. flip it around. Let's go to Kevin growing up. Let's talk about that. Let's start with that again. And, and just uh, give our audience, a, I want our audience to kind of, when the podcast is done, they know they feel like they know you. They know everything about you. So let's start with you growing up and transfer from there. I know we're getting in deep here, buddy. <laughs> uh, well, I grew up in a small town called Poughkeepsie, New York. It's not really so small, but I was raised by my mother. Uh, it was just my mother, my brother, and I. That's it. Uh, which plays a big factor into why I do what I do. Uh, I had no male influences, so my mother would take us to the movies every weekend. Uh, it didn't matter what it was, whether it was G, PG. There was no PG-13 back yeah. in the day, obviously. We remember, I think Temple of Doom was the movie that made it PG-13, <laughs> right? Ugh, oh, Kalimah! Anyway, I digress. Here we go already, off on a tangent. Uh, but Love it! Love it! It didn't matter what the movie was. We saw everything uh, opening weekend. E.T., you know, Rocky, Star Wars, Empire, Jedi, waited in line, the true blockbusters, you know. Uh, and movies became this larger than life thing. And then these guys started coming out. Stallone and, and Schwarzenegger. Uh, as I got a little bit older, Van Damme and Seagal came out. And uh, I realized that that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be, those were my male influences growing up. Were, were, you know, Stallone is, is my guy. Uh, he's just my guy. He's the, yeah, Stallone and I'd say Mark Hamill, but I'll really say Luke Skywalker because I have the values of a Jedi, but I got the hero mentality of Rambo, you know, so, and, and you know, and the fighting style of Rocky. So, you know, a, a mixture, you know, mix all that together. And that was my main influence. And my mother was a musician, she played piano. She wound up getting a pretty bad injury uh, in the early 80s. I don't get into all that, but pretty tragic. So her arm doesn't work as well, but she still plays. But music and art were her passions. So uh, I didn't really grow up with a lot of sports. Any sports that I did, I got myself into. Uh, but I got into bodybuilding and martial arts at a fairly young age. Uh, my mother bought me a weight set when I was 14 because she knew I wanted to be like those guys. And our family runs heavy. So, uh, you know, she wanted me to avoid the, you know, the, the make me curse and, uh, you know, and, and lose weight. Well, yeah. You know, so, uh, so I got into fitness and, uh, and martial arts at an early age that, but music was our thing. So I got the bass when I was 14 years old, the house was always filled with music. My mother played piano. Uh, so musician was my creative out. We were artists. See, I was raised by an artist uh, you know, and, and little did I know that watching Stallone and, and Schwarzenegger and Van Damme, that's art. Yeah, you know, I thought 100%. These tough guys. I never really saw it as art. I saw it as these movies, and but just an artist all around. Uh, but music was my creative outlet. Never really thought about acting or being in movies. That was always untouchable. But music was always right here in my hands. Yeah. Uh, so I was in bands. I you know hair down here. I mean, my hair is pretty long right now because of the uh, my macho man role. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the uh, uh, hair down here in bands, you know, from crazy metal to funk pop, 
uh, you know, Rush is my favorite band, my biggest influence. And I know you're Canadian, you know, Canadian, yeah, yeah. Canadian. massive, yeah. massive Canadian band. The guy, the guy's obsessed with baseball too. Oh huge yeah, yeah. Baseball yeah. Guy, huge baseball guy. Yeah. Fun fact is uh, my daughter's middle name, my oldest daughter, she's five, is Lee after Getty Lee, first and foremost, yeah. Bruce Lee. Uh, and uh, Lee Majors, because Six Million Dollar Man was also yeah. my yeah. TV god growing up. <laughs> so uh, the fact that all of those guys have Lee, and they're like my three, you know, major influences that way, uh, besides Stallone and everything, uh, it was pretty cool. So her middle name is Lee, Hazel Lee. It's, Hazel Lee. Uh, Hazel Lee Makeley. It's a it's a pretty good acting name. So maybe <laughs> yeah. we'll see. Uh, so so music was a thing, and then one day, you know, the, again, movies were always like the you know the it was the untouchable it was never even a you know like never really thought oh i've got to be in the movies i want to be on tv it was always like this other thing like you said music was my creative outlet and then one day i got a, a backstage magazine which is like this old publication i'm sure they still make it you could probably get it online yeah. uh it was for actors and uh for actors that are struggling to be actors or struggling to keep their career. You know, it was like inside information and a classified ad in the back for open calls or, you know, shows looking for extras or whatever it was. And there was this open call for a Woody Allen movie called Celebrity. And it was in New York City and I was about an hour and a half train ride away. So I hopped on the train with my buddy Wade. We go down to the city and I wait in this, you know, they call it a cattle call. And it's just this line for like eight hours, you know, just people mashed together waiting to get in it's like around the block you know five times yeah. so we wait and wait and wait and my my buddy Wade's just there for support he was my he was my guy wasn't into the acting at all but he just came he was like you know he was my my wingman my my man <laughs> so we get in and and the reason it takes so long is because Woody Allen literally gave me a minute I know a minute doesn't sound like a long time but when you're standing in front of Woody Allen or yeah. anybody like that face to face and there he's talking to you a minute is like five years right yeah. so he gave me a full minute of his undivided attention it's my name how am I blah 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 just wanted to hear me talk and see my mannerisms and clearly I'm very New Yorky because yeah. uh, I'm from New York I kind of lost the accent a little bit because I've been in LA for 17 years but this will never go away <laughs> uh, but uh so uh you know He's very nice, very cordial. I know there's controversy around him now. I can't speak ill of him because when I worked with him, he was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I yeah, yeah I fine. digress. I'm staying out of it completely. <laughs> yes. Uh, as much as I can. So anyway, a month later, you know, then I leave uh, and it was very cool. It was, you know, it was a little shell shocked. I was like, wow, wait, that's Woody Allen. He makes big movies. And here he is standing in front of me, talking to me, like broke that that barrier a little bit. And then a month later, I get the call, I got the gig. And just a glorified extra, uh, you know, where I just, I'm the cool guy coming in the club with a bunch of girls and, you know, we're dancing. Uh, so, I'm, but I'm very featured. I get to, they they really feature me coming out of, I'm the guy, we're, we're in front of the club. I get out of the limousine with two girls and we walk up, you know, follows me to the door. I did the doorman guy, hey, I'm cool. Well, I, I was, I was probably 20 at the time, so I couldn't even really get in the club, but you know, <laughs> movie magic. Uh, I had a beard when I was 14, so we're all <laughs> <laughs> So we go and we shoot the whole scene. Very cool. A month later, I get a call again, and they have to reshoot everything because the actress that was in that scene, she's no longer in the project. They have to reshoot all those scenes. So I'm like, cool, I'm going to go back and do it again. And, you know, so I go back and again. Of course, they truncate my role really tiny because they're, you know, that's the movie business. They're, they're reshooting. They have to move fast. Uh, so I think I get out of a taxi instead of a limo. You know, I have one girl yeah. instead of two. I go outside, you know, they truncate it. But the the woman who I'm now dancing with or dancing around, not necessarily with her, but I'm the guy right by her. She's dancing with, um, I forget who she's dancing with. But anyway, and it's Charlize Theron, a very knew nobody really knew who she was i think she did two days in the valley at the time maybe one other project that but she was very she was up and coming but she wasn't the oscar winner uh, you know, yeah. it was extraordinary that she is now uh and she was very nice and we you know we we had a great time and i got to talk uh she was much more involved with woody allen than the last actress so they were talking a lot and we were talking and uh, it was really cool it was just a really cool thing and then uh, you know, and then it went away. And then uh, two months, three months, four months later, whenever it came out, the movie comes out, the poster comes out, and it's all these little tiles, a black and white film, and all these little tiles of uh, all the actors that are on it doing their thing. And there's Charlize Theron, and she's like in mid 
dance kind of, and then right behind it is my eye like this. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. you know, like, you know, I have to tell you, like, if you look at it, celebrity is the film. If you look at it, look behind Charlize Theron, there's a very young Kevin right here. I made it my first, my first role. I made it onto the poster. It was, you know, it was very exciting. Uh, and when I thought that was it, you know, I made it. And then a long, hard road over the next, you know, 20 years to keep a let's, career. Let's, let's, let's talk about that. And that's something we talked about a bit last time. It's not this glim and glamour and bright lights that everybody assumes an actor has. Um, many actors are, I mean, I would say majority of them are struggling, right? They're, they're, they're either waiters and they're getting, they're doing daily jobs just to get enough to show up to a gig or show up to a, to an audition. Like what is the mindset and how do you keep going? Is it just that you're always you're, that one little gig just keeps you pushing on to the next Like, What, what motivates you to keep going? Cause it isn't, it, it's a very, very tough life. It's, it's, it's a tough life. You, you need, I don't want to say you need a backup gig, but you definitely need a steady source of income. Yeah. Uh, you, you can't go into it. Some people get lucky right away and book a job and, and I'm, I'm all for that. That's great. Uh, it's the, you know, but one job won't, uh, sorry, something popped up on the screen. Move that out of the way. Sorry. Um, you, one job is not going to sustain you, you know, unless you get a series regular on a show, but yeah, yeah. let's come down the line. Uh, so you need, you need a steady gig. So you're not stressing while you're auditioning, but what you need to do first and foremost uh, is be committed. I mean, this has to be what you want to do. If you think you're coming because, Oh, I'm going to be a star and I'm going to do whatever. I think you should change your mindset because it's why a lot of people burn out so fast. Yeah. They come in, you know, they have a friend who's successful or they've seen the stories or whatever. Maybe they're watching this podcast. Uh, you know, they, 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 oh, I could do it too. And you can, anybody can do it. It's not, it's not rocket science. It does take talent, but it takes commitment and hard work just like anything else. But you have to, you, you have to uh, study your craft. You have to be comfortable. I'm, if you're, if you even think you're going to come to LA or New York or Atlanta or anywhere, uh, yeah. Toronto, anywhere where there's, there's a business uh, yeah, go out for auditions, do all that, but you only get but so many first impressions. They say one, but there's a lot of different casting directors, so you might blow it with one and get in with another. Once you book a gig, you're good. But make sure you work on that craft, whether you, you know, this casting director told me back in the day, Joseph Milton, he happens to be one of my best friends. I love the guy. He's a big casting director. Yeah. I've been in a few of his movies, but he's, uh, he's, he's a staple in the Hollywood community. He said, you know, when you're not acting, Get the newspaper, although that's that's not a thing anymore, yeah. but get something and lay on your back and just read it out loud. So you're used to talking and used to doing and always used to doing yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, so I did that. And that's cool. And that helps because you want to talk. You want to hear your voice. Uh, you want to be used to talking, uh, which I know that sounds weird, but you want to be used to talking other people's words really, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and be natural. Uh, but you have to be comfortable in front of people. So you have to take an acting class and the only way to do it is an acting class or do theater or do something that gets you involved, uh, any kind of public speaking. Uh, you know, if you're if you're in school, you know, running for president or, you know, what, any of these clubs or anything where you're out in front of people, because that's what it is. You when you're watching a movie, all you see is what you see. But what's on the other side of that is a mass of people that are watching you do your thing. And if you're not comfortable doing your thing you know, then, then you're never going to succeed. So you have to get all that. And then auditioning is a completely different beast. You can be, and, and I'm guilty of this myself, yeah. but not, well, this is now going to sound, <laughs> uh, you can be an amazing actor and a terrible auditioner, or I've seen the opposite, an amazing auditioner. And then once you get in front of the camera, you're not, you're not a great actor. Uh, it's two different things. In an audition, you're really reacting with one person off of a script. There's no environment. There's no nothing. Uh, some people create that world and they're awesome at it. Yeah. And then some people, myself, it really helps for me to be in the world, in my scene. Of course, I can act in front of a green screen. I can do all that stuff. Uh, but my auditioning skills are not for whatever reason. It's not, you know, it's not up to par. Uh, it, I work on it all the time. I, I lay down tons of auditions. Uh, sometimes they hit, sometimes they don't. Uh, yeah. So you have to work on it. You have to be, uh, you have to be on top of your game. When you get the opportunity to audition is a gift. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we get stale, we get, you know, oh, oh this, oh, you know, oh. You, you, everybody complains about whatever gig they're doing, yeah. whether it's waiting tables or uh, fighting, right? Any job in the world yeah. is sitting behind a desk. Everybody, it doesn't matter how glorious it is in the beginning, everybody complains about it. Even if you're, I'm sure The Rock complains at some point because he's too busy or whatever it is. He probably doesn't because <laughs> he's a pretty amazing individual. So <laughs> uh, I take that back. But, uh, he, Auditioning is a gift. If you get an audition, you should put everything into it, know your lines, know what you're doing, have your intentions and go in and give it your all because you go in for a casting director uh, or you put it on tape these days because of COVID, everything is on tape. Yeah. Uh, and you give it your best and you try to be as real as possible and find something to relate to because that is what they see, the casting director. And if they like what they see, they send it on to the producer or the director. And if they like what they see, you get the gig, but if they don't like what they see, if, they can't, if it doesn't get past the casting director, it doesn't go on. Yeah. And if the casting director doesn't really like what they see or they think you're green or don't think you're that good, they might not see you again. So I'm not saying that you have to be amazing every time we all flub, but you have to put the work in every time. Yeah, I think it just goes in general with anything in life, right? I mean, it's preparation. It's, it's what's that saying? There's a saying that says something about you could be prepared if you're not prepared when the opportunity comes it, it always the doors are always closed right it's the people that put the work in that put the reps in that when the opportunity comes people are like how did he do it no he's been putting the hours in for years or months this just finally the opportunity has come for that to opportunity to, to take advantage of it right let's let's go back to a couple of things here your mom two boys um you guys could have dreamed off and, and gone in the wrong direction, uh, New York. And, and instead your mom with art, with obviously love, with a lot of attention, a lot of care, um, put you guys in the right direction. What does your mom mean to you? Oh, my mom is life, right? My mom, you know, my mom left my dad when I was an infant. Uh, because Do you have any relationship with your dad? No. And he passed away when I was like 14. We're going to get okay. a little, little in there. Yeah. Uh, but he had a drinking problem, uh, an opioid problem at one time. He was he was uh, he was in the Navy and he had got injured and on painkillers that, you know, kind of transitioned to his life. That that old story. Uh, so my mom had to leave. You know, she had the kids and she was young. I mean, she was young, 25 years old. Right. And this was the love of her life. Uh, and she had to leave and she left him for the kids, for us. And she gave up, you know, I told you, brilliant artist, brilliant musician. Uh, she gave up all her hopes and dreams to take care of me and my brother. Uh, wound up working three jobs just to put food on the table. We didn't have any money. Uh, very poor. Uh, not destitute, but certainly I didn't have a new G.I. Joe figure every week, you know, like the, the neighbors. And, you know, it was it was tough, but uh, very loving. But she wasn't around a lot because she worked. She worked, worked yeah. you know, at one point. <laughs> kid you not she worked at she worked her nine to five and then she worked <laughs> at jc penny's one job i remember in the jewelry department after work yeah uh, and then she wound up she saved a little bit of money and she bought a hot dog truck <laughs> so wow. before work she would drive this hot dog truck to locations you know like from like seven to eight or 6 30 to 8 30 like construction sites and stuff like that she would you know sell the hot dogs and then she would go to her nine to five then she would go to her night job and on the weekends we would go with her on the hot dog truck to hustle hustle yeah, you know and, and yeah it was uh you know at, at the time yeah, sometimes she would drop us off at school in the hot dog truck uh it, and the hot dog truck was called the dog wagon so we were like we were like dog boys or what you know made fun of and stuff like that but uh, you know, and at the time I was like, Ma, I can't just drop us off around the corner. You know, you know, like, no, I have to make sure you get in safely. You know, that that kind of thing. And <laughs> anyway, love, you know, at it. that time it was embarrassing. But now looking back at it, man, it's, it's so precious. So precious. It, know, made, I mean, it made you who you are, man. And 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 just think, you know, I have two young girls right now and I'm, I'm doing this career and I produce and, you know, I, I work out, every, you know, like I have a whole thing going on and I still have to be there for them all the time uh obviously we make sacrifices but i i didn't give up all my hopes and dreams to yeah. raise my kids I, I make it work uh i have a beautiful wife she's amazing she i mean she's she's the rock of the family right she's yeah. the 
one. She keeps it all together around me. And I, you know, I couldn't do it without her. But to think if it was just me or if it was just her taking care of the kids and what you would have to sacrifice, like I wouldn't be doing this career uh, if I, I would be, you know, at a, at a desk while the kids were in school and then I would be home. I wouldn't be able to go to Australia for three months to take care of, you know, to, to shoot a gig and, you know, work on a TV show or whatever I'm doing at the time. And the fact that my mother gave up all her hopes and dreams and I didn't get it until I was older and yeah. boy, do I get it now with, with the kids, but uh, we had it. Rough. It's, still, had it's it so, it's so crazy. Sorry, Kevin. It's so crazy that as we get older and we're roughly the same age, as we get older, we start actually looking at the sacrifices our parents made. It's you, you appreciate it so much more. And like we talked last time, I just lost my dad 12 weeks ago. And, so and, fun. and it, it's, it's, I, I sit there and it's like, sometimes I'll sit there and just, uh, and, and, and I just start thinking of all the moments and the things that he could have had for himself. And he didn't, he sacrificed everything he would work. And this is obviously going on me. So I apologize, but I just want to tell you this little story. Like my dad worked at Ford two weeks, day, two weeks, night for 30 years. Wow. Had a horrible sleeping pattern, always had sleeping pills just to get him through. And most people would take a week here, week here, week here vacation. He would block everything into the summer and block off four weeks every summer and save all his money. Didn't have a lot, but threw us in a car from Toronto, Canada. We drive up to Cape Cod, Massachusetts and spend three, three weeks on the beach every summer. And, and, and it was just all about building memories. He did everything he could to save for that moment. And it's like, when you're a kid, you're like, who cares? It is what it is. You're having fun. Now that I'm an adult and I look at my kids, like, and I could understand, appreciate those, those sacrifices their parents made priceless, man. It's just, it just, it shows what characters they had, what, what great individuals they were. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, real, real life superheroes, man. Just, yeah. I mean, you don't get more super, super or hero than that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Fun fact: You bring up Cape Cod. I was married in Cape Cod. So. Oh, you were, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's which Which part of Cape Cod? Provincetown. Provincetown. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Fun part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a very fun part. I was there once. It's funny because uh, when I got married, uh, one of the first trips is because I had such great memories of Cape Cod was I took my wife and we went on a, we, we went to Cape Cod and yeah, we ended up on the first day there, which I wasn't aware of the fun part of Cape Cod, the tip. We ended up there right in the middle of the parade and we had so much fun. It was so, it was, yeah, that was a, a memory from there. Then actually when my kids were old enough, I took them on a road trip to Cape Cod. Nice. So yeah, just building those memories, right? Let's transition to your wife. How long have you been married for? Uh, what was seven years in September? Well, this is fairly new, fairly yeah, new. but we were together four years prior to that. Yeah, yeah, years, yeah, years, yeah, years, yeah, years, yeah. So. Let's let's talk about your wife. I mean, obviously, as an actor, as you said, you might go to Australia for three months, you might be on a gig for two months. She has to be the anchor of the house. What does she mean to you, and, and, and how, how, yeah, what does she mean to you? That's the easiest way to look at it, and yeah, not, not, not to be cliche or whatever, but she's, she's my soulmate in the, the true sense of the word. You know, I'm not, I'm not a spring chicken and uh, you know, I got married later in life. I didn't, yeah. you know, and was it because of uh, you know, my mother was divorced. It really wasn't in my DNA, that yeah. lifestyle, yeah. Uh, you know, data lab, I'm a serial monogamous. I had a lot of long-term relationships, but never really anything resulted in marriage. And I got to say within two weeks of meeting my wife, uh, I knew she was the one. Uh, it took me five, almost five years to propose, <laughs> uh, but I knew she was the one. I didn't have any qualms about it. And then most of it, most of that about proposing was because it had to be an over-the-top, amazing proposal, and I couldn't quite figure it out. How, how, did, how did you propose? It took two years. Uh, we went to Big Sur. You, I wanted, you, you just led that up to something good. So if it's not good. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I, was, you know, I jumped out of a parachute and we're going to dive in with. I had a ring in an oyster. No, I, it's funny. So, yeah, we have a very small family. My, my mother and I, I'll go back a little bit and we'll I'll get to the romantic part of it. Okay. And uh, my mother was coming out and I knew that I wanted to buy a ring, but I had no idea what to do or whatever. My mother was coming to visit and I said, while you're, while you're here, will you go ring shopping? I'm going to propose to Christy. And I had uh, actually the year before uh, we were visiting her parents in, I think they were living in Florida or South Carolina at the time they moved a lot. Uh, and I asked, I traditionally asked her dad, if, you know, for permission and that whole thing. And uh, so that was really cool. It was very, you know, 
Shiver is old school. Manly thing to do. It felt it felt amazing. But then it took two years to propose, you yeah. know, at the end. But so then I, you know, so my mom comes out and and uh, I think it was the next day and uh, my wife went to work and you know I have a the actor schedule so I'm you know I don't always work during the day. So I'm with my mom and I said, "Well, you ready to go ring shopping?" She said, "Hey, well, come here." And so she opens this box and there's this gorgeous ring in there. What's that? She said, this was my grandmother's ring. Uh, and they and they got married in uh, in uh, 2012. I mean, I'm sorry, 1912. Well, they were yeah. And it was this, you know, she's like, this is really the only family heirloom we have. And I want you to have it, you know, and I want, you know, and at first, I was, it was beautiful. And I was like, oh, I, I was so conflicted. I'm like, aren't I supposed to buy her a ring? Am I supposed to give the, you know, but if you know my wife, which maybe you will by the end of this conversation, she's a very sentimental, beautiful soul. She's, you know, we connect on this soul level. We're completely too, you know, uh, she's a little, you know, Korean woman that reads lots of books of, you know, and I'm a, <laughs> like a giant heavy metal blasting, you know, comic book reading, movie going fool. You know, like we're two different people, but we meet together in this middle. It's it's amazing. Uh, but I knew it was the right thing. You know, it wasn't about, it's not about the money. It was about yeah. the sentimental attachment. And we don't have any family heirlooms. No, no, anything. Right? I don't even really know a lot of my outside family. I mean, you know, we're such a small, little, tiny family. The fact that somebody else existed that passed it, passed it, that passed something something down that I can pass down. And uh, anyway, it was gorgeous. So we brought it, it was dingy and it was old, brought it to a jeweler to, you know, to look at it, to clean it up. The guy took it and nearly flipped his lid. He was like, no, he was like, where'd you get this? What is this? And it's handmade. And anyway, so I had this ring and now I up the game with this sentimental ring with this story. And now the clock is ticking because they were married in 2012. So I needed to propose in 2012. Right. I need, I'm sorry, 1912. I needed to propose an 100 year anniversary, the whole thing. So uh, my wife has an affinity for tree houses, something about her growing up. She loves tree houses. So I found a tree house in Big Sur, California, that overlay in this, you know, resort. Uh, but they have this little quaint private tree house that's way off the beaten path and overlooks the Pacific Ocean on a mountain, you know, on a cliff overlooking the ocean and it's just this it's literally it's a tree house with like a rope bridge or whatever so we go and we're just going to have a fun weekend and, and we go there and then uh <laughs> so we go in the tree house and i have champagne things hidden in the back of the trunk champagne rose petals chocolates uh we're very into camping so i got these chocolate dipped s'more strawberries like yeah. they're chocolate yeah. anyway so i had this whole spread and it was hidden in the back of the trunk and we go out to dinner in the resort area and the, the the car is here with the stuff hiding in it. The the restaurant is here and the tree house is all the way over here. And I go in the middle. I don't know what else to do to make it, you know, because I'm trying to surprise her. <laughs> so and I want to surprise her at the room, not, you know, privately, not yeah. in the restaurant. So I'm like, oh, oh, I got a stomach ache. I have to go to the bathroom. I couldn't think of anything else to say. <laughs> and she knows I, I'm not a big public bathroom guy. So I'm like, I'm just going to run back to the room. I'll be right back, you know, whatever. So I come out. I run to the car, I run to the room, I set it up, rose petals, this, and the candles, and, you know, get this whole thing together, you know, and I'm gone, who knows how long I'm gone for, you know, could have been 20 minutes, could have been an hour, you know, I come back, I'm dripping with sweat, about as unromantic as it gets, uh, you know, like, she's, we're right, I'm like, oh, it was bad, you know, like, just, I had to play up the fact that I was in the back, because the surprise was more important, anyway, we finish up dinner, and we go back, and just be, I had music playing. And just as she walks in the, the, the ring, I, I, the ring was burning a hole in my pocket for, you know, I had it in my pocket the entire time because I didn't want to leave it anywhere. I was yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It was in my safe at home for as long as it was, then it was in, in my pocket. And so it was in there and she walked in first and saw, you know, whatever. And then when she turned around, I was on one knee and, and I did it. And it was in this, I mean, the most, it just pedals, the, you know, it was the traditional, I, I don't know, it, but it was special because it was a special time and a special moment, but it was typical in typical makely fashion. I had to use like a poop excuse to like make it happen. And like the whole, you know, so there was an element of comedy and, and craziness, but uh, boy, was it gorgeous. And the setting with the sunset and the, you know, window and 
the ocean and the tree house and we walked across a rope bridge to get in there and the door opens and it's just candles and flowers and champagne and she like turned around like what and it was like you know here it is and uh i couldn't even get it out i just couldn't even get it out you know it was just like <laughs> you know but uh and, and there wasn't you know my soul name I, and i couldn't have been happier and it's funny that the next day we call her dad yeah you know, her mom and dad and he was like it's about time. <laughs> he was like, I was going to ask you to marry me if you didn't ask her in a minute. You know, like it was, it was a whole funny thing, but uh, everybody was excited. And, and there it was, I hope that lived up to the expectations. Yeah, it did. It, it did. Very it did. romantic. And the, so, but it was all about that ring. So growing up wrestling, big part of your upbringing, like obviously you, you loved watching your, your old school WWF kind of like oh. me. For sure, for sure, man. I, you know, when was your first uh, introduction into wrestling? Watching? How old were you? You know, I was seven, six, seven, eight, nine. So, nine, so nine. you're at the same time. Do you remember? So, see, in Canada, I don't know how it was in the U.S., but in Canada, the main events were once a month on a Saturday night. Yeah, and it was yeah, late. Yeah. I remember I'd fall asleep. My, my dad would wake me up at like a 10, 11 at night on a Saturday, and that was that was when. The big stars would actually for it wouldn't be a secondary guy it would be the big stars going at it and that was a huge thing and my dad would sit there and watch it with me and and that was probably the same thing i was probably like five six years old when i started that yeah man it was you know it, it's funny because you know I would, all about the movies and then you know and these larger than life guys and then all of a sudden there were these real guys the real yeah. guys wearing superhero costumes you know being crazy and good guys and bad guys and it, it, it just all unfolded in front of you and it was it was unbelievable we used to go to the mid hudson civic center which consequently you know or, or coincidentally i should say was where macho man made his wwf debut and i might have been at that one i was very young uh i might have been at that one per se because we used to go whenever my mother could, you know, save enough money for us to go. We would go because yeah. they came there all the time. Yeah. Uh, well, not all the time, but enough, a couple of times a year. And we, yeah. we would go there. And, uh, you know, I remember uh, actually met Macho Man one time in the diner. It was, this was probably in the early 90s. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was Macho Man and Vince McMahon. It was before he went to WCW. Uh, they came in the diner. They, I didn't go to the show. They must've been at the civic center. I was a little older. We were in a band. I think we had got done with a gig and we were at the diner. That was the spot. You go to the Dutch yeah. diner, uh, and, you know, have your coffee and your pancakes, you know, the late night spot. And then there I, I go to go to the bathroom and out comes macho man and Vince McMahon, like, like what was happening right now? And they're like in the diner. It couldn't have been cooler. And Macho Man was still just Macho Man. Vince McMahon was very nice. They didn't give us a lot of time, but it was just like, oh yeah, brother, oh, nice to meet you, you know. And I, so I got to meet him, uh, which was really cool. Uh, but yeah, I used to. I mean, every weekend, I can't tell you how many beds I broke to the floor by you know <laughs> jumping down or flipping over. You know, I used to you know grab blankets and do the Ultimate Warrior. And uh, <laughs> I used to, you know, it's so funny. It was it was Macho Man. And then later, Ultimate Warrior. Yeah, uh, I just had this affinity for for Nikolai Volkov. Was yeah, like, yeah, just yeah. Something about him, and obviously the Iron Sheik. Uh, Iron Sheik was a big character, man. That guy, just but, incredible I mean, character. So awesome. But I used to I used to uh, try to make Russian applesauce. You know, I remember <laughs> like I used to take the apple and like it's Russian applesauce. You know, and just <laughs> squeeze it. Yeah, you know, I like take both hands and make Russian applesauce. It was so you know, and then I'd flip my bed over. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what you did. Uh, I, it, just these larger than life guys. They were so influential on me. Uh, not you know, not an attitude and not anything, but maybe not an influence to, to what I wanted to do, but just watching and enjoying yeah, of course. Like, I, I, I think we all thing, you know i think we i think majority of gentlemen in our age bracket all had their moments watching the wwf oh, and those sure. characters and the ultimate warrior and and just even like roddy roddy piper the characters are so fascinating right at that oh, age oh, oh piper Talk about when piper. you when oh. you heard of the opportunity to play macho men how did that come about and and uh how did the audition go? And I'll give, give me a little understanding of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny story, actually. So uh, more history. Yeah. Uh, my brother is my agent, my talent agent. Oh, he is. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we keep okay. it in the family. It's great. Yeah. Uh, he's the, Does he's he work the, with other artists as well, or just you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So he runs the theatrical department in Stewart Talent. They're in New York. They're they're actually I think they're Atlanta, L.A., and New York. But the main okay. hub is in New York, and he's there. Yeah. Uh, he was out here for a long time, but he's there. I'm getting into the whole story of how that all came about, how he became my agent. But we've been working together for you know decades. Yeah. Uh, so I get so I get this call, and you know, and it's a, it's a it's a love hate love relationship, right? I love yeah. my brother. Sometimes I hate my agent. And I love my brother. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, it's like that's how it is, and he feels the same too. There's so many times, you know, I said, you know, if you weren't my brother, I would fire you. He was like, if you weren't my brother, I would drop you. You know, we like, <laughs> you know, it's like you know, but then you know, we love each other. So it's a it's a love hate love relationship with hate being the smallest part of it. But yeah. anyway. I digress. So we, so I get this text from him and I, this, this is also another story around that too, but I get this text from him saying, I need a, a picture of you dressed as the macho man ASAP. Yeah. Uh, so to give a little history on that, I've been the macho man for Halloween three, four times, three, four yeah. different years, uh, you know, make my own costumes, you know, macho man's my favorite guy and what a good uh, costume that is for Halloween. I mean, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, one year I think, uh, not, I think one year I made this real elaborate one and I got all these slim gyms and we went to West Hollywood uh, <laughs> in LA and they, and you know, they did the, the biggest parade and thing. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, stop it, it was slim. And I'm like throwing slim gyms at people. Right? It was <laughs> amazing. Anyway, so he knew he's my brother. He knew that I was Macho Man for Halloween. So I send him a picture and then he, he gets back to me and he was like, all right, you know, here's this audition. You have to put it on tape. So I get it. And it's very cryptic. You know, it says Young Rock, but all the names are changed except for Macho Man. And it's so funny. They So they, they always give a description of what they, you know, in an audition, you know, male, you know, 35 to 45, you know, six feet tall, this, you know, brooding soul, but a happy guy, you know, they have like a weird description of, of, you know, for any role that you do, they have to describe it so you can kind of make up a character. So they're like describing the Macho Man. Then they put a link to you know, I think it was uh, the link was Macho Man proposing to Elizabeth was like the link that they sent. And they're like, we're not looking for a caricature, but this is the guy. And I'm like, why are you sending me information on Macho Man? Doesn't everybody know who Macho Man is? Why would you? But OK, uh, so I bust out my old costume, you know, and I have to put it on tape. Uh, and I just wear pieces of, you know, one scene I'm, I'm naked, so I don't wear a shirt. One scene I'm just at a barbecue. So uh, my mother keep my mother lives in New York. She keeps a box of clothes here. Uh, in the attic. So I go in the attic. I know, I know my mom has something funky that would be macho manny. Uh, so I find this pink tank top. That's my mom's. So I squeeze <laughs> into this pink tank top for one, you know, and I, ooh. And I, so I, I do this five scenes and I do the audition and I, and I try not to put too much stock into it, right? Because for whatever reason, I didn't think in a million years I would get it. So I just wanted to have fun with it. And I had to find, I didn't want to just, you know, oh, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Like I didn't want to do it. You know, like everybody's going to do this. Yeah. You know, like I didn't want to do that. I wanted to try to find who's the macho man when he's not doing a promo or in the ring. So, you know, I kept the voice, but I just made it very conversational. And I added a couple of whatever. And I did all the scenes. And then at the very last scene, you know, I'm in full macho man, you know, like the whole thing. Uh, but I do the scene straight, you know, uh, and then I look right at the camera and I'm like, Stop it, Slim Jim. you know, I just like broke, broke the character from the audition. And I just, and then I just, I just cracked myself up and then let it be, you know, and I just, I just sent it like that. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to get it anyway. So I might as well have had fun. Anyway, then I, I get a call from my brother. He says, they really like you. It shoots in Australia. You're going to be gone for like three months. Are you good? I was like, um, wait, I really got what what's happening. He's like, Macho Man. I'm like, are you kidding me? So like now all of a sudden I'm like, uh, you know, and then he calls me back again. He was like, you're in the final running. They're just waiting for The Rock to watch it, uh, you know, to, to approve it. Everybody else has approved it. And I'm like, so uh, I usually use a Vimeo link, uh, yeah. to, to, you know, put it and you can see, you know, when it gets viewed. Uh, for the most part, unless if they download and take it off. But so it's like at like eight views. Right. So it's been watched eight times. And every day it's like Wednesday, I'm watching, you know, Thursday, I'm watching it, Friday, I'm watching it, nothing, Friday, 9 a.m., nothing, 12 a, uh, you know, 12 p.m., nothing, you know, 12, 15, it goes from eight to nine views. And I'm like, uh, uh, the rock just watch my, the rock just watch my, yeah, my, my tape. And then like a half hour later, the phone rings and I got the gig and I'm like, you know, like, are you kidding me? You know, like, ooh, yeah, you know, we're freaking out. 
and, and we got the gig. But the moral of the story is with my love hate love relationship with my brother that I love dearly, I, you know, it's very <laughs> endearing. But if I was even with, you know, like a, a different agent or a bigger agent, you know, a CA or whoever, uh, they wouldn't have known that I was Macho Man for Halloween. And so I talked to my brother later and he said, you know, when I submitted you, uh, you know, my picture is pretty clean cut, the IMDB, that whole thing. They passed. They didn't even want to see your tape because they didn't see it. They didn't see you being macho man. Uh, he was like, but I knew you were perfect for it. That's why I asked you for that picture. Yeah. I sent them the picture. They're like, oh, okay, I could see it because clearly here I am as the <laughs> macho man. <laughs> uh, so they so they saw me and I booked the gig. But had it just been like, oh, okay, pass, yeah. you know. We're not, you know, like, oh, on to the next one, on to the next audition. I would never got it. So it's like, it's all those years, you know, me and my brother, like, just led up to that moment, uh, you know, that career. So you guys are shooting season two now? Or have you started yet? Uh, yeah, in October we start. Hey, you got you got to pull this out because I, I saved this on here from last time. This guy? <laughs> High five, macho man. <laughs> <laughs> give me, give oh. me, give me, give me a, like a little line a macho man line and we'll end at the end of macho man part from there but give me a little line on macho man uh, oh boy i can't uh you know on the tower of power too sweet to be sour funky like a monkey space the place and sky's the limit Ooh yeah there's no warm up there though <laughs> you know what's crazy is i had diamond dallas page on our podcast i've had a few wrestlers but i had diamond dallas page on incredible person like heart of gold like I can't even stress good what dude. a good do this is. Like I told him the whole story of my son, um, everything my son's been through. And literally like a couple of days later, he sent a whole care package for my, like just a good dude. We talk on the phone all the time, like just a legit good dude. And he was telling me some stories on Macho Man. And he's like, Macho Man doesn't matter what, day, like he was, it wasn't character. Like that was him 24 seven, 24, seven, 24, seven. That was him. He that's, took that's that role. He, he took that role and yeah. it just became, it became his, that persona became his identity. He's living, you know, the gimmick, man. I mean, the, you know, he was living that. I mean, he was, he, he kept it real for real forever. He evolved a little bit as he went on, you know, like in those later years, when he got really swollen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, got a little bit more tough biker guy. Yeah. I got yeah. that guy, but uh, a little less flamboyant, but yeah, it was, you know what? doing the research for the role, right? Not to get back into Macho Man, but doing the research for the role, that's what it was. So in the audition, I made up that, you know, that thing. I just kind of kept it a little, you know, yeah, didn't go too crazy. But then, you know, now I got the gig. Now I have to, I have to find this character. And in every interview, every story, every everything, that's what everybody said. And I, you know, he was always the Macho Man. He never shut it off. And I said, well, I can't, I can't go on TV and oh, you, oh, you, you can't do it the whole because it won't play. It, that, that's, yeah, it yeah. doesn't play in real life. There had to be somewhere in between. So what I figured out was or for me, for my character that, you know, Macho Man, you know, he runs at an 11, you know, you, yeah. and you don't shut him off. You just yeah. turn him down. So yeah. He's always this guy. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's always this guy. Yeah. He's always that guy. He's not always this, you know, he's not. Yeah. So I, I turn him down and sometimes we turn him up and sometimes we turn him down. And in that moment that I, that found that, you know, the, the, the peace in, in it and found that, you know, the, the grounding, you know, that, that I needed for that role to go in with confidence. And yeah. uh, cause we all do a macho man. In, in yeah. We'd all do a good one. Yeah. It's not, you know, uh, but it, you know, the mannerisms, you know, I just, you know, it, 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 it all fit together for me. The, the, the personality was the last piece, obviously, I, you know, I, you know, I, I fit the bill, right. I, I kind of look like him. We have the same hair, the same beard, same build, you know, we're both six two, two thirty. you know, we all have that going on. So uh, that's what got me the role. Cause we can all do a macho man in, in yeah. impersonation, but what gave me the confidence to pull it off and not get skewered by the fans, which would be me too. If it was somebody else uh, was that, that turning him down. Uh, and it gave me the liberty, like, you know what, like nobody really knows what he is like off screen. So if I'm having an intimate moment with my friends, you know, that's how it's going to be. Yeah. You know, he's going to talk like this, but it's going to be real, you know, yeah. and it was just so much fun. And boy, the producers, they were so amazing. And so I mean, after day one, Jeffrey Walker, the director, he's also a producer, came up to me and he said, uh, he was like, you nailed it. I said, 
oh, that, you like that? He's like, no, 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 you nailed it. Like whatever you're doing to do what you're doing for him, yeah. you should be proud of because it's a tough character. Like really didn't know how it was going to be. You know, love your tape and whatever. But now we're here. And whatever you're doing is working and you should be proud of yourself. And I was like, wow, you don't really get that. You know, it's an ensemble. Yeah. Test and, you know, we're uh, like, you know, to sort of sing them out. So, oh boy. And, and that was after the first day. So that really, up, you know, okay. and then uh, you, we got into like, you would do it, you would do the lines and then they would write some alternate lines for you to do. Uh, you know, so I would try some stuff and then, uh, you know, I said, you know what, can I do, can I do some things, you know, and I started doing machoisms, you know, like it's that little bell or too sweet to, you know, or, you know, yeah. sort of like an eagle slithered with the snakes, Ooh, you know, like all the little <laughs> things that he says and wherever I can apply them to the script or just make up something that sounded like that. Oh, they were eating it up. They loved it. And, and they allowed it. A lot of it didn't make it to the, to the uh, actual show, but I, I think that they let me do it because it was just fun yeah. and it was infectious the whole cast. crew, the cast, anytime I walked in, you know, cause as soon as I, as soon as I left the, the hotel, I was macho man, you know, I didn't <laughs> shut it off. I'm not a, I call myself a method in method in the moment actor yeah. where you know, I'm not like, and I'm not Daniel Day Lewis where I got to do it. And you know, I don't ever get yeah. out of character, but I, uh, you know, you got to amp that up. Cause even like the little one that I just did for you, that was completely cold. No, you know, yeah. no prep, you know, so you gotta, you gotta get it going you know, get that machine going. So I'd walk on set and I'm already just talking to everybody like this and I'm dressed as the macho man and we're having a good time. And, uh, and then, you know, I would like walk down the hallway and I would hear it. Oh yeah. Over here. And, oh yeah. <laughs> Dig it. You know, like everybody's just doing it everywhere I go, but like having a blast, we just, we, man, it, the coolest crew, the coolest cast, best producers, the, everything with this show is just so amazing. It's just a family. Anyway, uh, what a great experience is what I'm getting at. And, is there, is there is there is there is there a, is there a future there for a Macho Man movie? Uh, you know, that, I mean, I, I, he's listening. such a he's such a well known character that I mean globally, I mean that would be a hit if done right. I you know I hope so. I mean, they are doing the Hogan story. Chris Hemsworth's playing yeah, Hogan. Yeah, I yeah, know yeah. There's a Macho Man in it. They're not shooting it yet, but. You know, they haven't called me yet, but they're shooting it in Australia, I believe, and we'll yeah. be in Australia. So yeah. you never know. That would be <laughs> amazing. Uh, you know, but as an actor, do you want to just play one role? But I would I would eat up a Macho Man movie or a Macho Man series in a second. Obviously, it's the most fun. Uh, you know, I, I, this, my last movie that came out on, on Netflix uh, a year or 2020, late early 2020, uh, Badland. I yeah. star in it. I get to ride a horse, which is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I'm like a self-proclaimed cowboy, self-taught cowboy. Yeah. I get to shoot guns and twirl things and, you know, fist the cuffs and all the other things that, you know, and I'm a big Western fan. I got to live out that whole dream. And I was the star of that movie and I produced it. So it was, you know, I was like, it was amazing. Yeah. But Macho Man, you know, just as a side character in that show, so fulfilling. It's like, a, you know, it's just that. Anyway, it's, it's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about your production company. When did it all start? How involved are you? Like when you do production, are you actually acting in all your films as well? Or are you actually just doing, have you done just full production on the side? Out of the five that I've produced and released, uh, only one of them, well, two of them, I guess, I have small, smaller supporting parts. Uh, but I usually, you know, I got into it. It started at about 2016 uh, because I've been at it for a long time. It's so many, you know, oh, this is the one, you know, uh, so many close calls. Uh, it's not about being famous. It's about working so much at acting that I don't have to do anything else. And I can support my family. And, you know, that that's really what I want. And acting is my passion. So with digital age and everything, you know, going on, uh, decided to take matters in my own hands and make my own movies. So uh, I had a partner at the time. We don't work together anymore. That's a whole other story. But uh, we we made a film called Any Bullet Will Do. Uh, it was really just the actor. and But I really was on the inside of everything. I wound up becoming a producer on it towards the end. I star in it. If you, if you like Westerns, check it out. It's on shameless self-promotion. But on Vudu, Amazon Prime. Uh, you can watch it for free on Tubi. What was it called? Any bullet will do. 
I think Bill will do. Okay. It's, it's a fun movie. If you like Jeremiah Johnson, uh, you'll like this movie because it really takes place in the snow. And it's like this grizzled, you know, big beard, long hair, uh, headhunter, you know, bounty hunter, headhunter. Uh, you know, it, it's cool. It's a fun story. Uh, beautifully shot. Uh, and everybody committed. Oh, boy. And that's a whole other story. But anyway, we hit it off and said, you know, we should just be making movies together all the time. So started a production company. Uh, the name Pop Octopus came about. That's the name of the company, Pop yeah. Octopus Productions. While we were doing pickup shots for Any Bullet Will Do, we were stealing shots in Yellowstone. Eh, don't tell anybody. Uh, so we were like in this caravan of like three or four cars. And uh, we were in one, you know, anyway, we had radios. And over the radio, we hear like, you know, Pop Octopus, come in. You know, it's all broken up. Pop Octopus. And I saw people like, yeah, Pop Octopus here. What's going on? You know, and it was like, what, what are you talking about? Who's a good? And, Anyway, so that it, something garbled came over the thing. It sounded like they said pop octopus. So it became the joke for the for the rest of the shoot. Yeah. And then later we said, you know, that should be the name of the company. It's so out there. It's funny. <laughs> it was born from a movie that kind of birthed the company anyway. So and then it stuck. And that's what it is. And never once do we, you know, do I really uh, sometimes I have to repeat myself once I pop octopus. What, what's the name? Pop octopus. Oh, and then you, you never forget it, right? Because yeah. it's it's so out there. Uh, and it's P-A-P-A, -A, Octopus, yeah. Pop Octopus. Anyway, so uh, we went on to make another movie called Big Legend, which is a, a Bigfoot-inspired movie, which was spawned out of a Bigfoot encounter that I had one day, and I'm not afraid to admit it, but that's a whole other story, too. <laughs> uh, it's a whole other podcast, man. <laughs> but, uh, and, and then, you know, and I starred in that one, and we were creating movies around me uh, you know, because I I might not be a list level as far as my you know career goes yet. Uh, we're getting there, but I I certainly am you know that guy, right? The action mm -hmm. hero -y guy, right? I pride myself on it. Uh, so tired of Hollywood, or I shouldn't say Hollywood, just the business in general. Hollywood is mm -hmm. very specific. Uh, you know, controlling what I do, right? And you're an entrepreneur or entrepreneurs, you you either have to take the bull by the horns or yeah. you're at the mercy of everybody else. So decided not to do it. So we, you know, we're like, we're going to make our own movies. I'm going to star in them. And then we'll put other stars around me so we can get distribution. And, you know, so we got Lance Henriksen and Adrian Barbeau and Amanda Wiss in yeah. uh, Big Legend. And you can see Badland is peppered with, uh, you know, Mira Sorvino, Bruce Dern, Trace yeah. Atkins. Uh, Wes Studi, this is, you know, Jeff Fahey, there's so many good actors in that. Uh, it's amazing. So it was, it was born from, well, the, the desire to act, yeah. uh, but the desire to take matters into my own hands. So with the digital age, uh, you know, they, they shot, I think the original Avengers was shot on a red camera. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the first editions and you can rent a red camera for nothing or you can buy a used one for nothing and you can make the same quality content. Obviously, you have to have the talent. You need somebody that knows how to shoot. Uh, but it used to be film and film was expensive and you couldn't take do a lot of shots and, you know, it's hard to move around. And you, there was a thing about it. And then where did it go after that? But now with the streaming age and the digital yeah. age. Yeah. Anybody can make movies. You just yeah. have to do it smart. So that's how it started. And it and it took off. You know, we got all those movies distributed. And then, you know, so the budgets went from like, you know, 50,000 to 100,000 to a million, to, you know. And, it's and so, it's so crazy when you think about that. And that's nothing compared to some of these big boxes. It's nothing. But it's, it's crazy. But it's, it, it's when you think of a million dollars to a project that you're going to cross your fingers that you're going to get distributors for it. It's, it's a risky business. It's a it's a very risky business, but you know I I like to feel that we I don't want to say we perfected the model, but yeah. put all the money on the screen. You have to put the money into the cast. And if anybody's listening that that's thinking about getting into it, movie production or start you know starting a production company or making their own content or whatever, do it. You should do it, right? You got to like any entrepreneurial thing. That's you know the theme of the podcast. You have to take risks and you have to take chances. Uh, th there's a lot of people between you and yes. And if yeah. you don't take yes for yourself, if you don't make the yes, you're waiting for somebody to say yes. And does it happen? Do sure, you, it happens. But, you know. Do you find a lot of, and see, I'm, I, I'm coming from the outside, obviously, of the industry trying to look in. And 
this is something I've noticed, and this is even before speaking to you, I've noticed with, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but like Adam Sandler, a lot of actors are either directing, producing their own films now. And this is something where, this is going back for like a, a, quite a few years, I've been seeing that a lot more of. Right. So this is something where a lot of guys or a lot of actors, actresses are taking control of their own situation like you are, which that is something that really started happening in Hollywood. You know, I mean, like look at John Krasinski did a Quiet Place and a Quiet yeah. Place too. You know, he directed yeah. it and starred, directed, produced and starred in the first one. He has a small part in the second one, not for, you know, spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, you know, but got more money and you know, produced it and and directed the second one as well. Uh, so yeah, it's it's happening. It's not, you know, I, I don't want to confuse the two. What I do at, at this level is very independent. A quiet place is also independent. It's you know, it's a small. Yeah independent movie, but on a much bigger, much bigger scale with major star power behind it doing it. Yeah. Uh, so I don't, I, I only say I separate them because at the end of the day, they're both movies. If you take like Badland, for example, I'm getting off topic, I'll, I'll bring it back around, but Badland, you know, if I really told you what we made it for, you wouldn't believe it. But when it debuted on Netflix, it went to, I mean, it had a little run. It was in the theaters briefly. It has, you know, DVD, Blu-ray, uh, you know, it was all on that transactional video on iTunes and yeah. Uh, you know, you could pay for it, but then it went, you know, it does that run and then it went to Netflix and it shot up to number three, uh, in the most watched movie on Netflix, number three. And it's just pretty amazing movie. when you think about it was, that. It was, I mean, it was, I couldn't keep it together. It was like, not because that it was this hit on Netflix, but the fact that it's only a hit on Netflix if people watch it, right? Yeah, Netflix yeah. is an algorithm. Yeah, it's, it's all algorithm. You know, if, if people are watching it, it generates it, you know, then it puts it on another list. So, you know, it started at like, uh, you know, number seven, and then it went to number five, and it went to number four, and then number three, because once it was number seven, because people watched it. So it, yeah. it got up there, and then it, it climbed up, you know, and it was like a Netflix original, a Mel Gibson movie, and then me. And the Mel Gibson, you know, Netflix original was Netflix. It's like the biggest studio yeah. there is right now. Uh, the Mel Gibson movie was Lionsgate, which is probably the biggest indie. They're, they're yeah. still in yeah. because they're not a studio, yeah. but they're still, I mean, they're a, they're a mini major, we call them, right? Yeah. It's just a big, you know, uh, with millions of dollars behind them. And then a truly independent film made by, you know, me and my team uh, put out by us through a company called Cinedime who puts out small films. And you can't tell the difference. You don't watch and go, oh, this is a low budget movie. But, you know, you it, you you watch it just the same as any other movie. So you can you can make no. But as long as you have talent, you have a good script, you get talented people acting it. Uh, you put names in it. Right. You have to put a couple of names or people won't watch it. Yeah. You have to put a couple of names or distributors won't pick it up because they know people won't watch it and nobody wants to put the money out. So yeah. if, if you take one piece of advice besides doing it make your own movie if you're thinking about it do it uh put a name in it you have to put a bankable name and if you don't know what that means talk to people get advice talk to distributors talk to people that you know uh find me on instagram at kevin makely ask me questions about it i'm happy to give you know what i think a good name is or whatever uh find people that you can confide in because some people think that you know you might think a name is worth something uh, and you pay all this money for it. And it turns out the distributors like, yeah, that doesn't bring us any money. So we're not going to buy your movie. Uh, so there's a, there's a, so you're still a little bit, you know, uh, at the mercy of the machine a little bit, but yeah. you could do it on your own terms and do it right. You can certainly make your own movie uh, without any names in it and make a great movie. I'm not, and, and it happens and it could get picked up at Sundance or anywhere else. Cause it's so amazing. Uh, but name value is really something you have to do. And I, I had a point to it all. Oh, so the point is, is that one next to the other, you really can't tell the difference, right? Yeah. You might be able to tell between that and an Avengers movie because that's you know way up here, but a truly independent film, and it made it to number three on Netflix because people watched it. Eyeballs were on it. And that was so inspiring. Like, wow, I made this movie and it didn't matter. It doesn't matter what you say or you say or you say or you say. <laughs> The people said they liked the movie and they watched it and they told their friends to watch it. And they told Netflix basically to watch it because, they, you know, so that right there. And, and just so you know, when a movie goes on Netflix, you don't really make a ton of money. This wasn't about the money. Right? I was going to ask, I was going to ask you that. How does that, I mean, you don't have to give me numbers, but how does that work? Is it, is it all algorithm on viewership? Like every, every no. view, how does that work? 
it's a licensing deal. Oh, so okay. there's, there's really two ways to go with Netflix. Uh, either they they produce it, well, three ways to go. They either produce it, you know, and they're, it's a Netflix movie and they hire you to produce it or they bring their own people because you have IP, right? You have a great yeah. script or whatever and and they they produce it and they make a Netflix original or they buy it because it's so good and they make it a Netflix original, right? And they pay yeah. you, you know, they don't pay, you know, but that's it. Or like what they did with Badland, they licensed it for X amount of time. So right. they give us a licensing fee. Uh, but we don't, so let's just say a license, uh, keep it simple, 100,000. So 100,000 yeah. for six months. Uh, let's just say it's that. So in six months, it could be watched 20 million times. You don't get a dollar more. You get yeah. the licensing fee. So it wasn't about the money. It was about one, the prestige, but, you know, of being in the Netflix top 10, in the top five, in the top three. Uh, but it was the, I just can't explain the feeling of that. You know, it's not, it's one thing if you, if you star in a movie or you act in a movie and it becomes a big movie or it wins an Oscar, but to develop it, produce it, raise the money, star in it, act in it, you know, uh, involved with the editing process and the scoring process and the every detail about that movie I was part of right from from you know from the idea to the delivering of the film and it's your baby you know, it's my it's my baby and and yeah. you know and other people were involved like, yeah of course yeah uh, I'll just say uh, Jennifer Ambrose and Sean Nightingale my my partners in that film phenomenal people amazing just amazing. Couldn't have done it without them. And, and uh, the list goes on and on. I want to give my Os Oscar yeah. speech, but uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, just what a good, satisfying, amazing feeling. And so just to prove the pudding, if I, if I told you how much you made it for, I don't like to divulge that information for yeah. business reasons. And you know, what? but if I told you what it was for, you'd be like, oh my God, I could do that. If I can do it, you can do it. Anybody can do it. Certain guidelines you have to follow. And, and again, I'm happy to answer any questions for anybody. If anybody ever you know, wants to ask, find me. Uh, but you should just do it. It's not, it's so attainable. It's so attainable. And because of that now, so many doors have opened. Because yeah. now it's not a fluke. It's not a, you know, I made a film that the masses like. Now people want me to make movies for them. Yeah. You know, the pandemic really hit us hard as a small independent company. Yeah. She just had to push a movie out uh, to the new year. We were supposed to shoot in September. A amazing movie, uh, horror thriller. We have Bruce Campbell attached to yeah. star in it. Yeah. Uh, so this is one that I might be taking a, a, a back seat to just producing uh, and being creative on it. I might play a small role. We'll see. Uh, and only because I'm not really right for all of the roles and I don't yeah. always have to star in them. Yeah. Uh, it's just hard to make a movie and not be in it or direct it uh, and just produce it because I, I am a creative guy. I'm, I'm, the, I'm an artist. So to just be the producer, sometimes it just doesn't scratch that itch for me. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it's, a, it's, it's a tough, it's a, so I guess that's going back to your original question 20 <laughs> minutes ago. Uh, it's hard for me to make a movie and not be in it or direct it because directing is also very creative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, which I've only co-directed so far. I directed a short, uh, but yeah, directing is in my future. I'm definitely gonna direct one of the next features coming up for sure. And I'll probably direct it and star in it. Against the advice of Bruce Dern, who specifically told me, don't ever direct and star in your own movie. You're doing yourself a disservice because you're great at both. And you don't want to, you don't want to diminish. It doesn't, didn't Clint, I'm thinking how many movies Clint Eastwood has directed and starred in. I know. I mean, Outlaw Josie Wales, one of my favorite of all times, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I would say his lot, even quite a few of his last ones. Oh, I mean, oh. I mean yeah. every movie he's made in the past 20 years, he's directed. Yeah. Which is and, such and an incredible, such an incredible fucking actor. Oh my God. On my I mean, bucket list too of, uh, I mean, if you watch Badland, I keep, sorry to keep bringing it back around to the things that I've done, but if you watch Badland, uh, literally, I'm Clint Eastwood, <laughs> Rambo, and Luke Skywalker all wrapped into one character. It was like it was really like our love letter to westerns and my personal love letter to my favorite characters, uh, you know. And it makes no bones about it. Like we're, you know, it's like. We're not trying to be anything that we're not. We're not taking. You're not taking it too seriously uh, with the homages because yeah. I mean, literally, there's a showdown at high noon, and yeah. we and we go to the eyes. It's an homage, but we play it straight, right? We don't play the homage. We just homage because we love it. 
yeah. love it, right? Not stealing anything, not whatever, just our influences in Westerns. That it's all there, you know. So some people might say, oh, all the tropes are there, all the cliches. Oh, you don't have to see the movie. You've seen it before. And then other people go, oh, my God, it's exactly what I wanted to watch because it's got all the things. You can tell that these guys made that movie because they love Westerns. I have one oh, question so to say. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, we, we can literally have like three four podcasts here i have one question i always ask all our guests near the end and uh oh, two questions i'm gonna ask you one because you i i know you're a little superhero geek like me you can see all the superman I, I, my whole office you see this place it's like a wonderland of toys here um favorite superhero and if you had a superhero power what would it be oh it's tough uh my Tied for my favorite superheroes, uh, Green Arrow. Green Arrow. Green Arrow and Green Lantern. And because... Uh, oh, our Canadian buddy destroyed Green Lantern for you. Who? Oh, what? What? Did you, did you, did oh, you watch? Oh, 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 Ryan Reynolds. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, wait, in the comic, did I miss something? Wait, what happened? Did you kill him off? What happened? What? I'm out of the loop. Uh, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I don't say anything bad you know, about it. <laughs> He did his best. And he green, the, the Green Arrow, Arrow, I mean, that's it's playing on to how many seasons on TV now? Oh, I think it's off now. It's I, off I now? Back at the very end, uh, you know, because I'm a, they, they did it really, I, I was so, it was like, that was my guilty, well, Smallville was my guilty pleasure. I'm a, I'm a DC guy. Uh, so DC am I. So am I. To, you know, for the kids to fall asleep a little early so I could rock out Suicide Squad, I'm dying to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Almost gonna let my three year old and five year old watch it with me because I otherwise I can't watch it. I'm like, <laughs> I have to see the movie. Uh, but a huge DC fan. Uh, it's just, I mean, I grew up on it. My my uncle, he uh, he died very young, uh, I think in the in the early '80s. But he was a comic book fan. I mean, he had Superman number one, Batman number one. He he had everything. He had been wow. he started collecting them when he was a kid in the early '60s. Or maybe in the, I'm sorry, in, in the 50s, I think yeah. in the 50s, 50s, late 50s. So he had everything. He had everything. I mean, you know, and didn't keep them in mylar bags. He had like this shelving system where he just kind of put them in. So uh, he would turn me on to all kinds of stuff. And so he got me a subscription to Batman when I was, a, a, I mean, a, a kid. And my brother got Superman and we read them like crazy. And then one day he gave me a Green Arrow, Green Lantern comic where they used to, you know, they used to pal around together. Yeah. I fell in love with it. I, you know, even today, still today, my my favorite color is green, which is weird. My kids are always like, "What's your favorite color?" I'm like, "Green." They're like, why? And I'm like, "It's all green arrow." You know, it's like I can't think of anything. You know, I'm the Emerald Archer. I love it. So, uh, so I got turned on to that, and it's just something about the regular guy, and he's very political and he's very true, but he's not afraid to. You know, there was this. Mike Grell wrote this comic. I would say it was in the '80s called uh, "The Longbow Hunters," I believe where it was a different take on Green Arrow. There was no boxing glove arrows and none of that stuff. It was a very real gritty, you know, he killed people when he had to. And it's just so, so it was so cool to see, you know, my guy in that kind of light. And it was just, you know, a game changer for me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so Green Arrow and then Green Lantern, because I, I just grew up with that and I, I love the power. It's like whimsical and it's cool. But, but what I find is that they're both regular people. Yeah. They don't have superpowers. The, the Green Lantern's power is powered by his ring. Yeah. Uh, but he needs willpower to control the ring. It's not just mindless, you know. So yeah. so it's about him as the man with the willpower. And the ring only seeks out somebody that's, you know, it's like the Excalibur of you know DC uh, power weapons, right? It's it only yeah. seeks out qualified, worthy. You have to be worthy. Right. And, you know, with everything, not not just strong enough or fast enough, you have to be <laughs> worthy to wield the ring. Right. Because it's a big responsibility. So they're both just regular guys that have become superheroes. And and it's not like I didn't seek that out. It's just who I fell in love with. So yeah. even to this day. So whoever is out there, the powers that be, if you're going to make a Green Arrow movie, I'm your Oliver Queen. That would be <laughs> that's that's my. <laughs> Tip top dream role is to be Oliver Queen in a in, in a maybe 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 Papa uh, uh, Octopus produces one. I you know I mean Stranger Things have happened right. I would <laughs> I would kill. To do that. But uh, yeah, so that's 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 that. Uh, 
And then in the in the Marvel world, uh, Deadpool is one of my favorite characters. It's such a it's such an incredible. I mean, Ryan Reynolds, like I, I mean, I think that guy's incredible. I, I put him next to The Rock right now for just personality, giving Amazing. back. Like it's just he's doing incredible things. He's such an incredible. And he's he's actor. one of those you know character studies like he makes acting look effortless right effortless like you see him and then you see him in a row and people go oh it's just playing himself oh it is so hard to play yourself and you can try it like try to try to look in the mirror and read something and read it in your own voice while you're looking or or put yourself you know like put your iphone up and record yourself being yourself reading somebody else's words try it it's hard you can do it you have to practice but He's so effortless. He's so likable. He's just such a yeah, likable, likable, likable. I think that's uh, the big thing. And the charm and the charisma. He doesn't take himself too seriously, uh, but he almost he almost takes himself not taking himself too seriously too seriously. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like that's yeah, his yeah. shit because he doesn't take himself too seriously. Uh, but he, yeah, he's an amazing talent. Yeah, uh, he's doing. Sure. Yeah, he's just those Deadpool movies. I mean, they're just. You just sit there with a smile on your face watching them. Yeah. They're so they're so well put together. I, so I, I love, love them. them. Love them, love them, love them. And that's, you know, because he was involved and he liked the character. You know, he had a passion for the character and he had a say in how it was going to be. And it's like, yeah. no, this is, you know, I, this is how it needs to be. And it's like first, well, one of the first rated R or the biggest rated R comic book movie to ever come out, right? And that's huge because yeah. you, you think of comic book book movies kids are going to see it so if it's rated r you're excluding a whole audience yeah yeah, but yeah. it was that good that you didn't even have to be a comic book fan to enjoy the movie oh you don't have to know who deadpool is to enjoy that movie yeah. and the, you know the the costume i always thought it was you know a rip off of spider-man a little bit uh but it's a you know really what it is is a rip off of uh is it dead shot Dead shot yeah, 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 right? yeah, that's, yeah. That's Slade Wilson, <laughs> dead shot, who looks much like Deadpool, and then Deadpool is Wade Wilson, and that's the old uh, Marvel DC where they just like constantly rip each other off. Uh, you know. what, what, how did you like the uh, this is us nerding out here? How did you like the um, uh, Captain Marvel movie? There's Captain Marvel and the other one, what's the uh, what's the DC one? Oh, Shazam. Shazam, Shazam. I don't know why my head was thinking. Yeah, it was original Captain Marvel. That's why I was thinking in my head. How did uh, you like Shazam? I, I, I dug it, man. I thought it was fun. You know, it was like, I want to see my Shazam, you know, take on the rock as Black Adam and look like that, right? Because Shazam is is arguably the most powerful. Powerful, yeah. Yeah. In the universe, right? I, mean, I think, they, I, I think they ruined the character with that movie. I think they kind but of... But at the same time, well, because they were... I know what they, they were could have to. turned that they could have put made it into this incredible character that would really propel DC and they didn't. They just I don't know. I think they lost they, 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 went, they lost they went on funny it. With it. Yeah, yeah, they went funny with it. For what it is, I you know, when I first saw it, I was like, you know, Zach Levi and, and again, another tremendous talent. He's, yeah. I, he's that you know, he's like a triple threat, that guy. Uh nothing bad to say about him. But when I first saw it, I was like, really? Yeah, really? Like, why why would you cast him? Uh and then I and then, and then I get it because they were playing on the Billy Batson, you know, the, the yeah, kid version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And had, you know, it was almost like the superhero version of Big, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like uh, I'm still this kid, but I mean, oh, that's cool. And all of that discovery and all of that fun stuff, you know, he nailed it. And if you yeah. would have got a guy like The Rock, uh, but The Rock has good chops like that too. Like if you watch Jumanji, he's good at like playing a different guy yeah. inside of him, you know. But if you would have got, you know, like Batista who could you know fit that role or you know somebody else though by the way all tremendous actors but they got a comedian you know with good chops to do that because they were you know they're really looking at the first you know hour of the film when it was yeah, this yeah. discovery uh, and that all worked great yeah. it was just you know housed in in the body of zach levi which i wanted to hate you know i'm not gonna lie not because i hate him because i think he's tremendous but uh just miscast but it, yeah. it worked i i thought it worked yeah uh, I, I didn't hate it but i went in with I, I, did, I didn't enjoy it my son enjoyed it but i mean maybe that's the demographic they're going that was for. right if yeah. you see so for the producer and me gets it what yeah. they were trying to do yeah. and that's where you know and and they nailed what they were trying to do uh they didn't make it for the fans yeah. per se like the hardcore fanboys like us yeah 
but they made it for a specific audience. And for that audience, I see how it would work. Like I would wa- let my daughters watch that film. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it's fun. It's funny that you said one one actor, actor, wrestler, that I've I've been so impressed of how he's transitioned into the acting world. Because the first couple of films, I'm like, this guy should not be here. And he's transitioned. And Guardians of the Galaxy, I swear to God, he's probably one of my favorite characters. I just laugh my head off with him as Batista. He has really transitioned in the last two years or so. And really, like, he's really honing his craft. I agree. And and he's looking, you know, I read interviews with him because I like to follow the big guys. Yeah. I, I love the resurgence of the big guys. I mean, yeah. they all happen to be wrestlers. You yeah. Know? Uh, I mean, I guess Henry Cavill, you could put him in the big guy category. At least he's, you know, he's yeah. kind of his fit. Uh, but like these, you know, massive guys, you know, The Rock and Batista, John Cena is another one. Were they? I think John Cena has a lot of work still to do. Yeah, but he's, I haven't seen Suicide Squad. He actually got really good reviews. At least he did, huh? Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to see, he does have some work to do, but he's doing the work. Yeah, he is. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. So he used his name value as a wrestler and the fact yeah. that, you know, The Rock kind of paved the way for that. And, uh, you know, and, and there, he's working at it, you know, and, yeah. and, and he's continuing to do movies. He's not just, you know, they all cater to their strengths. Like I, I don't think if Batista didn't get uh guardians, I don't think he would blow up the way that he is. Yeah. Uh, Cause he was playing, you know, he was in uh the James Bond movie playing that bad guy perfectly cast, but then you see him in Stuber. It's a little bit different. You know, he's a little out of his elements, uh, still hilarious. But I, I enjoy that movie with my kids. It was it was fun. I mean, it, it was, was a fun movie. It was a fun Peter movie. Yeah. In it. I like to plug yeah. her all the time because she's great. But uh, but he's working on his on his crap. But he, he but he picked a role that was perfect for who he is. Right. Yeah. That that role in Guardians is perfect. And now that's giving him the platform. And now he's he's really working on his craft to be a, a fantastic actor and not just be the big guy. Yeah, uh, he'll yeah. never not be the big guy. He always has to get. He's not going to get cast as you know the skinny little guy. Uh, so there'll always be the element of that, yeah. uh, you know, the big guy in there. But he's broadening his range, and that's what he wants to do. And and that impresses me. I, I like that. I, think it's I great. love that. One last question for you, Kevin. If something were to happen to you today, in a few words, how would you want to be remembered or described by your loved ones? That's throwing great your father. Way love great it. Great father. That's it. It's all love that matters, it. man. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. One thing I have to say about you, and I'm so impressed, is your open willingness to help others in your industry and just in general. I love that because I spent three and a half, four years. I took 64 entrepreneurs under my wing. I've turned some of them from ground zero to seven figures. I never charged a penny, never charged a penny. I love business. I love seeing people do well. So you hearing you say that touches home and I, and I appreciate that. And, and uh, yeah, that's awesome, man. And I think that is the biggest issue with a lot of entrepreneurs, um, whether, whether you're an act, whatever you are career wise, a lot of people are scared to ask for questions, ask the questions. They're scared to reach out to people. And I tell this all the time, exactly what you're saying, where, if you want to be successful, you find people in the fields that you want to be in that have reached that pinnacle, that peak, because most of those people at that level, they're willing to help. Yeah. And they can save you years, months, so many stumbles along the way by what the lessons they've learned. So if you are in a situation, whether you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to be an actor, you want to be a producer, whatever it is, reach out to Kevin, reach out to people that are in that situation, that have been there, that have lived it. And God, just ask the right questions, man. That could save you so much time, so much stress. So, so much. I love that you said that. That was as you were talking. That's probably one of the things that keeps clicking in the back of my head. So I appreciate that. Yeah, man. It's you know, I wish I had that kind of. We all wish we had that kind of help, right? You, you like to pay it forward. It's not you know, there's hundred percent for everybody, right? Yeah. There's not you know, and even if even as an actor, you know, and and it gets tough as an actor, you know, you. Back when we were going to auditions, not to transition to a whole other topic, but, uh, you know, I always see the same guys at the same auditions. You know, we had that, you know, the, the you know, the, I had long hair and a beard. It would always be, you know, these bikery guys. If I, you know, was clean cut or whatever, it was always these guys. But it would always see the same people. And it's like this competition. Yeah. 
And it gets tough because it's like, then you see the show that you read for and that guy got it. And then the commercially read for it. Oh, that guy got it. And you get this. It's very easy to get that. Yeah. Uh, but that, that consumes you, man. It consumes you. And if you're thinking about who got it or why you didn't get, you know, well, you should always think why you didn't get it, right? Why uh-huh. didn't I get it? Is there something I can do to get it? Yeah. But in this business, it doesn't matter. You could be the best. It's like with, with the Macho Man. If I didn't have, you know, if I was, you know, uh, five, five, I wouldn't have got the Macho Man role, right? So the, a lot yeah. of factors were in place, not just talent that led me to get the Macho Man role, right? So there's there's always a lot of factors, but you you could be the the best, you know, I always think to think back on Rush even, like Neil Peart, Neil Peart, uh, rest his soul, God, so hard, 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 hard time losing him. But uh, we fancy him the best drummer in, yeah. you know, in, in rock and roll history. He's amazing. And it's amazing. Uh, but growing up, we used to be in a band with this guy, Brett Mylan. And it, every bit is good. You know what I mean? You know, and, and never made it to that kind of status. So uh, just because you got it doesn't mean you're the best. Yeah. yeah. Just because you didn't get it doesn't mean you weren't the best. Yeah. You know, you just got to be the best that you can be always, especially in this kind of business where you have to be in front of people. And you have always, to be always likeable. be prepared. Uh, yeah. And, it, you know, I, I guess, you know, a couple of words of advice, that, you know, like I said before, just do it. You should just do it. And, if and you know, just decide, just decide today you're going to do it. Just do it. It's not that take down the curtain, take off the mask, whatever your, your hang up is about whatever. Don't say, well, I got to wait until I lose 10 pounds to get my head shot. I say stupid crap like that all the time. Uh, you know, I got to just wait until, you know, my daughter graduates from school. So I could get all that out of you. I don't know why I said that one, but you know, whatever your excuse. But, but it's a hundred it's, 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 you know. it's percent the excuse. Right. And I think a lot of people are always looking at the future, waiting for that moment, waiting for the next opportunity, or they're, they're so stuck in their past and they don't right. live in the present. If you just live right. in the present and do what you can today that's alter tomorrow, that's all you could do. And I mean, it, it's it's crazy that that's as soon as you said that, the first thing that came to my head was the movie Up. Remember the movie? Do you ever watch Up? Of course. You, you never, it's, you, it's, it's the bare fact that you don't know what tomorrow brings. Life is so unpredictable. For you to wait for that perfect opportunity, it's never going to come. Whatever is in front of you right now, you got to take advantage of those opportunities. And and when they're not in front of you, you got to go out and get them. I mean, doesn't matter them. what it is. Doesn't matter you what make it them. is. Make your own opportunities. So you got to do it. You got to do it to the best. You got to give one hundred fifty percent. If you want to do it, you got to do it because everybody else is also trying to do it. You got to do it. You got to do the best that you can do it. No excuses. And then the, the third thing in this business, anyway. Well, I guess in all business, be humble. You got to be humble. I think that's in yeah. life in general, man. Yeah, it, it is in life in general. It's, but it's, even it's got to be humble. I mean, it, it, people humble. people attract to people that are authentic, that are real, that are vulnerable, and that are humble. That if you could be those things and come and just come out every day and show up, people are going to attract you. And and people when people start attracting you, good shit happens to you. Agreed. Agreed. hundred percent. And that's the way it is. You know, the, whether you call it the universe or God yeah. or the law of attraction, whatever your reasoning is for, you know, but you put good out, good comes back. When you put yeah. negative out, negative comes back. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. And you don't, you, you know, I'm not saying you have to be like that 100% of the time. Yeah. You should be striving for that 100% of the time. I love that. Right? We're all, we're all human. Yeah, we're all human, and we all have our moments. I have my moments. You know? Yeah, we all do, man. Yeah, you know, yeah. so uh, but it applies to you know hitting the gym. Keep you know you got to just got to be healthy, whether it's the gym or whatever. Like take care of your body, take care of your mind, take care of your family. Be humble. All of those things. It all goes. It all goes Holistic, it's holistically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love you said that too. Where I'm a strong believer. Where I mean, business is huge to me. I mean, I have a whole bunch of corporations. Family is more important than anything to me, but I still put myself atop everything else. Mentally, physically, spiritually, I'm a strong believer. Like Oprah, you got to fill your cup up. You got to take care of yourself first. And if you're at your highest peak, then you'll be able to serve everybody else. You'll be able to take care of everything else. So you got to, and a lot of people get so focused on family, so focused on their business, on their careers, and they don't take care of the one thing that runs the engine, right? The engine in there. And and, and they do, yeah, they burn out. 
they they're not be able to serve. They're they're giving half-assed everything they do, and they then they question why things are not happening because everything they're doing is half-assed. Yeah, you you have to take care of yourself. You have to, and that's and that's all three, like you said, mentally, spiritually, and physically. You have to, and spiritually. I mean, that could be that doesn't have to be all a whole. Way. It could be just just taking care of your mind, being in a good place, right? So I love all knowing that. knowing that it's it's not just about this. There's there's yeah. a connection with people, yeah. Yeah. you know, just like you and I hit it off. There's a yeah. connection there. Is it spiritual? I don't know. You could take it that way. Yeah. Uh, or it's just two like-minded dudes having a conversation, but yeah. there's something about it, you know, just in general. So what, however you perceive it, like I said, it's religion or the universe or nonsense to you. It doesn't, it, you know, whatever your connection is to other people and, and the world, the earth, everything is uh, yeah. just something there, you know, but like to what you're saying, it's like a, uh, when the oxygen mask falls down, you know, in the airplane, you got to put it on yourself first before you put it on your kid yeah, you know, or whatever, because you have, this has to be intact yeah. in order to do that. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's, you know, as simple and as, you know, of an, of an analogy as that is, it's very, it's true. It's true. It's yeah. very true. And it's very hard as a parent sometimes, but you oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Like, like me now and get off on a whole talk, but I'm very into uh, fasting and, oh, and I intermediate fast. I do too. You do? Oh yeah. The, I do. Yeah, I finished my, my last meal is at between eight and eight 30 and I don't eat nothing till one o'clock the next day. Yeah. Nice. 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 Yeah. And I, but I want to do it Monday to Friday. Yeah. Me too. I eat on the weekends. Yeah. yeah but then yeah. I usually go Sunday. I try to stop eating as early as possible. Do a 24 hour. Oh, you do 24. I've never done 24. And sometimes I'll do, you know, 36, 72. Yeah, huh? I think five days is my biggest, but the you've the, done five days. Oh yeah, for sure. And it's, it, I guess, I, and on day three of my first five day, I deadlifted more than I've deadlifted since I was like, you know, 20. People don't realize I'm a strong believer in, in, in your body has two functions. It's either digesting food or it's healing. Right. For sure. And well, people don't realize that. And people yeah. don't realize that. And, and I think if people were to focus more on fasting, whether it's intermediate fasting or long-term fasting, but eventually you start with intermediate fasting, diabetes, like there's so many factors that could be beneficial for, and people don't listen to that and don't pay attention to that. And it's something that's, it's not some, a lot of, a lot of fitness gurus are using this now. This is going on ancient years, man. You look at cultures, how many cultures adopted this? How long ago? Yeah. Yeah. It's so, oh, it's incredible. incredible. To cleanse their body. Yeah. You know, know, whether it's cleansing of sins or cleansing, whatever they had this, this, knowledge somehow of knowing that a fast cleanses your body and that's what it yeah. does it cleanses your body okay, but this, i i do it oh, yeah. go no, go, 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 go. I, I do because i well i do it for a lot of reasons but the main driver is because i had kids in my 40s right yeah so i'm gonna be you know my 80s when they're 40 you know like and that's old and i don't want I, you know i want to be a grandpa i want to be you know i want to be around i want to be able to play with my kids so the, that research that, you know, like, how do you turn the clock back? That's what got me into intermittent fasting yeah. uh, for the most part. So it's so healthy for you for longevity and yeah. for mental clarity, cognitive yeah. abilities yeah. and everything else. Uh, so anybody that's teetering on it or wants to learn about it, you should look at intermittent fasting because it's yeah. the number one thing you can do for your, for your health. Yeah. I mean, there's I, I've been, I've been at it now it. for two two and a half three years and how who actually turned me on to it was um a gentleman a friend of ours uh one of our close friends was diagnosed with cancer and um he lived about a year after he was diagnosed um in his 40s passed away and one of our other friends who was into intermediate fasting um tried to really help him at the end and it was too late at that point, but he really adopted it. And, and I started understanding and studying and it has been about three years. I, I, and yeah, your energy levels, you're, you're like, I, I'm up at four 30 every day, buddy at four 30, every wow. single morning. And it's not because I love to it's because <laughs> I, I sacrifice myself right. because I'm home. I mean, I'm today. We're a little late, I was, I, but um, I'm usually home from three to seven every night. That's my family time. Three to seven. I turn off my phone. I've, I haven't missed dinner at home with my family for about 12 years. Amazing. I'm home every night with my family having dinner. And, but in order to do that, I work from 
four 30 and I don't get up and like, Oh, I work out. I work out with my son at night. I don't, I get up and, and I do my, I do a little meditation. I do some about five, 10 minutes of core just to bring my energy levels up, feed the dog, have my black coffee. And, but I get more done from four 30 or five till nine o'clock. than most people get in their whole day. I'm done my day. Nice. And then the rest of the day is some podcasts and interviews. Um, I'm, I'm just coming out with an, a, a sixth. I don't know if I told you this last time, but um, since my dad passed away, I wanted to keep his memory going. And uh, it's been 12 weeks. And a week after I told my, I looked at my wife and said, I got to keep his memory going. So I, I, I sat down for about a week and I wrote six children books. And wow. I wanted to, um, and the, all the books are characters of my dad and my two kids. And awesome. each book's a lesson. We're going to come out and release a book every eight weeks for a 20 year period. And the first one is going to be released in about a week and a half, two weeks. And it's called Grandpa Joe's Adventures. And it's, first one's called Strawberry Mountain. And it's a lesson on gratitude. And everyone's a lesson. And a, a, and, and a money raised from that book is going to go to Sick Kids Hospital, which was a big part of my son's upbringing. So um, I'm always going, I'm always doing something. But and for me to be able to do that, I, I need to have the energy and fasting has become a huge part of fasting vitamins. The way, what, what you put in your body is so, so important. So I appreciate you, you, uh, doing that. I'm going to ask you like my podcast is usually like 45 minutes. We're going on to almost hour two now, which is crazy. One last question. Yeah, man. Bodybuilding. Did you ever compete? I did. Yeah. Well, so did I, what age, what age did you compete at? Uh, let's say my first competition was, I was 23. Okay. Mine's was 20, 19. 20 or 21. I did three shows. Nice. I'll send you pictures. Oh, How many shows did you do? Uh, like seven. So you, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like 23 to 29. And my last show, I did all, all natural, never steroids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all natural leagues. Yeah. And then the last show I did was on, it was like aired on ESPN and it was like this big thing. It was in New York City. It was a big deal. It was yeah. cash prizes and, you know, and I was pro card at that point and it was great. And boy, I, I worked out, I wound up, I was doing spray, you know, I wanted to come in biggest and sh most shredded that I've ever, you yeah. know, obviously. And uh, I was getting older, so I had something to prove. And I was doing sprints on a 25% incline, 12 mile an hour. You know, it was doing like sprints. Like, I, I you know, I'd say it was hit training. We didn't call it that at the time. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, for as long as I could do it. And then I would just jump off and I would go back. Anyway, I got a stress fracture in my left foot. Uh, from doing that, you know, like going so hardcore and being so depleted, I competed with a broken foot, you know, and I didn't, it didn't fault me, you know, like I didn't, you, nobody knew, but it was so excruciating. So that on top of everything else, and I'm in the back and guys are talking about, you know, how they passed the, you know, the, the, Oh, it's such a, it's such a dirty sport. Stuff. And I'm like, you know, but I hadn't experienced that today because yeah. I, I went pro my first show when I went in the overall, which was a, Surprise! I was like, oh my God, yeah, that's amazing. But, uh, you know, but I competed within that, that organization for a couple of years and then I branched off to this bigger one. And it was like, just when, you know, like, uh, like I think mean, McGuire was busted with steroids and, and the wrestlers, you know, and all that stuff started going down with, and so steroids became taboo. It was like, a yeah, yeah. so a lot of these guys doing steroids came down to the, to, uh, and also natural started going up, right. Yeah. Because it was much more. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's all about the big guys, but the natural circuit started taking off and it, right, you know, when I was in there. So, uh, so I like literally like sweating blood for this competition. I put my all in it, broken foot, all this didn't even tape it. Cause I didn't want it to look yeah. funny. And, you know, out there gave it my all. And for the first time, and it's not a vanity thing, but for the first time I didn't even, I, I think I placed seven, you know, there was a lot of guys I placed seven and placed in the top six. So I didn't go on. Yeah. Uh, and that would be fine obviously, because, you know, yeah. only one guy can win, only six guys can place in the top six, right? And there's, you know, 30 guys in that in that class. But the guys in the back were talking about how they were doing steroids and got away with it. Yeah. And, you know, joking about it and whatever. And I was so enraged. I'm like, here I am, you know, sweating blood for real, like hurting, you know, dying to be the biggest and the hardest, the best that I can be. And you guys are just doing steroids. Yeah. Like working half as hard as me, maybe working as hard as me, but you have the unfair advantage. If I was to do steroids, you know, at 29 years old, you know, I think that year, 28, I benched 405, uh, you know, like that's how strong I was, you know, I worked out, yeah. you know, since I was 14, I was so strong, you know, you get depleted when you do these yeah, shows, course, like, yeah. you know, at the, at the epitome of strength and physique and, you know, 
And like, so if I was to do steroids, how gigantic would I ever be in the IFBB? You know, but that's not what I, you know, I'm an yeah. advocate. Again, anybody listening that's influenced at all by me, do not do steroids. There's a million other ways to get to where you want to be. Don't ever do it. Uh, and look at all the guys that are in their 50s and 60s that were contenders back in the day in whatever sport they were doing. They're all dropping like flies. And it's because they did. Oh, it's, 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 it's the wrestling world. It's, oh, it's so sad. I don't want to say anything negative. So, about the wrestling yeah, world. yeah. But it's such a it's, it's, uh, it's so sad. So, so sad. And even, like, even, the, even the bodybuilding world. If you're into it, if you used to watch it, get all the flex magazines and all that, like there's a big, big chunk of them. I mean, there was, there was, you would read some articles or these guys would be like, they would have candy jars full of just pills. And they would just every morning, they wouldn't even know what they're taking handfuls in their mouth. It's crazy, 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 crazy. Your body can't, you know, you don't realize it. Or you see all these guys and you see all these guys with, with the big guts and they're like, they got a six pack with guts. It's all the GHP. Like it's crazy. The stuff they were taking. Enlarging everything. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, man. No, it's awful. And you're, and you know, and and, and your heart is a muscle. So your heart grows. Yeah. Your owls grow. Like it's, you know, your organs grow. It's just not healthy and your body can't sustain it. No. You know, uh, you know, even uh, Schwarzenegger had like open heart surgery. Twice twice already. Twice. Uh, you know, so, but he was proactive about it. And his day was a little bit different anyway. It's yeah. not like the guys today uh, or even in, you know, the late eighties and stuff, but uh, so don't do serious. But so I went after that show, you know, I went and I, I went to the, the judges. I said, you know, I'm not ratting anybody out. I'm not saying anything because, you know, everything is fine. I said, but, you know, guys are talking about doing steroids. And this is a natural competition. It's actually a judge that I, that I knew personally. Yeah. So I, I didn't, you know, cause I don't want to, I'm not messing with anybody's game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, and he was like, he was like, yeah, we know all about it. I said, you know all about it. Yeah. He was like, well, you know, he was like, the big guys bring in the money. Yeah. You know, people come to see the big guys. And I'm like, do a fucking big guy show. Like, what are you doing? Why are you doing a natural show? And, you know, it's that's like doing steroids in the Olympics and taking the gold and thinking you're the best in the world. Like, come on. Why, you did, know? You, did, you, did you not find, and this is one thing I found with the sport and what really turned me off was there's two factors of it. Um, one, the mental aspect, you're never happy with yourself. I find, yeah. I found that I, you're never satisfied, which I guess could be a positive thing, but it's also could be a very negative thing mentally. And second, it's, it's very unhealthy. Those diets, it's very uh, the way you dehydrate yourself. I remember sitting in bed, like we, we would do the water cut starting six days prior. And I would start off like, I would, I would piss into a cup and, and then I would intake 75% of that back in water. Then it would go to 50%. You drink your own piss? No. Not piss, just the water. And then you keep going, going to the last two days. You're like depleting yourself. No, and you're mentally waking up at three in the morning. Like I need water. Even though your body didn't need it. You just, it's so, so you're putting yourself through torture just to step on stage Man, for a plastic, for then, a plastic trophy. I know. I know. But if you knew then what you know now, yeah. like if I knew then, I would fast yeah. and do the competition and not, you know, and, and come in better. Because yeah. if I did the level of training that I did, you know, it's like I always did fasted uh, cardio. I knew that much, right? Yeah. Like I'm at that time, but it was always, you know, six, seven meals a day, right? I would, oh, I would, yeah, every two hours. Every two hours, right? I would do my fasted cardio and then I would eat bl- plain oatmeal with egg whites in it, you know, yeah. like a hard boiled yeah, yeah, egg. Yeah. I would eat it, you know, and then I would lift. You know, and then I would, you know, do my day and then I would do cardio again at night and I would go to bed. And if I had that level of intensity to my training with my fasting now, you know, I mean, I'm getting there. I I remember my last, my last show, Kevin, I had five foods. That was all I was allowed to eat. We were eating eight times a day. It was egg whites. It was hip steak. It was chicken, tuna and brown rice. Nice. That was the only carb I had was brown rice. And no, just brown rice. That was the diet I was on. And I was literally eating that eight times a day, every two hours and everything was weighed. And it's, it's this obsession and it's, and, and reality is even just in general, like all that, like I was putting what 300, 350 grams of protein in my body. Like how much damage did I do to my damn little kidneys and my liver? It's and, and you crazy. don't even know, right? Cause that, that excess amount of protein spikes your insulin because oh, you're totally yeah, you go to like like what neoglycogenesis or whatever. It's yeah. like it's so much that your body has to do something with it, and yeah. so you you know so it's counterproductive. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, like it, it, there, if, if the science of it now is it's different. Know, it's a different it's world altogether now. Now I was I, promised I was, we yeah. should do it together. I was promised myself that I would do uh, a master's. You know, once I was over forty, 
I would go back. I, I, I would not go back. I don't know if I would do it, but <laughs> I, I, I made myself promise myself and I don't want to, you know, let myself down. But I guess if anybody's <laughs> going to let me down, it's going to be me and that's okay. <laughs> but Okay. Uh, this is... That. This has been uh, this has been a fun conversation. We're gonna have to do it again. When you said you're off in October to Australia again? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Do they already have it pre like set for more than two seasons, or is it just two seasons? Well, right yeah, it's a, they'll renew it season at a time, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. See how it goes. And you know, it's great. Is you know, this time I, I made such you know first time going was like into the unknown. You know, yeah. like excited yeah. or whatever. But boy, I've never made such friends on set. Uh, and we're all going back. You know, we have this, we call it the gentleman's club and it's, it's me and Andre, the giant, you know, Matt Willig is, you know, uh, Chavo Guerrero, the angry Samoans, the angry, some of the wild, the angry Samoans is a punk band. I don't know why I said angry Samoans, uh, the wild Samoans, uh, my, my, you know, my two, my two boys, John he says Chavo Guerrero, he was playing, he was in the, what character did he play? He was in there. No, he's the, he's the wrestling coordinator. Oh, he is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, and he, boy, what a good dude chavo guerrero i mean he literally trained me to do the flying elbow and we literally like if you see the show that's yeah. me doing the elbow uh for real and i've never been on the top rope before you know i fancy myself an athlete for sure yeah. but, uh and it was on the day you know i remember first day when i first the first night i met him i was like just so you know i do my own stunts uh, you know, I like get thrown from horses for a living, that kind of thing, like in the movies. So uh, I want to do the flying elbow. He's like, not going to happen. I'm like, why? He's like, it's dangerous, you know, when you're good at it, you know, it's yeah. dangerous. He's like, it, it will, it'll never happen. I was like, all right. And then the day before we were doing the Royal Rumble scene, uh, he was like, hey, man, uh, you want to do the flying elbow? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, I do. And then the next day comes, uh, you know, a little anxiety about it. We, we we have all our other moves down and all our other stuff, but we were looking for things to piece in, you know, in between the main stuff that was happening in the, in the rumble. They needed to make the whole yeah. battle royale, I should say. So, uh, you know, half the day goes by and I didn't practice it and whatever. And we break for lunch. We come back, which, you know, here's another tip for an actor. Don't eat lunch. <laughs> If you're, if you have a demanding shoot or whatever, skip the lunch, man. And you'll, every time I eat lunch on set, you got to rent it a washroom. You just get exhausted. You know, you yeah, digest, yeah. you know, like if you want to stay in that mental clarity and be on, you know, skip the lunch. Anyway, that's my method. Uh, I skip breakfast too. I digress. Anyway. So we, we come back from lunch. He's like, all right, you ready? And I'm like, for what? He's like, going to do a flying elbow. I'm like, but we're shooting right now we're, we were shooting yeah. he was like he was like yeah yeah, it's easy come on let's do it so i get on the second rope and they put a pad in the middle and he's like you know and i've obviously i've practiced it in my head one bajillion times right like i've seen it you know uh so i do it and he was like he was like okay uh let's do it off the top so i climb up the top rope first first time ever and boy i can tell you you know six two so i'm i'm, I'm six feet off you know, so the, the rope's like four feet high. So from my head to the mat is 10 feet, right? Yeah. But from my head to the concrete floor outside the ring, which is just behind me, you know, is, you know, 15 yeah. feet or, you know, 12. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you're high up there. Yeah. You're up there, right? So, you know, you get, you know, got to get over it. But it's like, I'm so in the, in this, all the extras in the crowd, filling out the crowd it was like four rows and then green screen behind it, obviously. Uh, all chanted macho and watching it unfold, right? Like watching me get taught how to do it while we're, you yeah. know, it was all there. It can't, yeah. So uh, we do it and I, I fly to the, you know, we had to do it on a pad. Um, I do, I do one from the ground to finish the elbow finish, uh, yeah. for a real wrestler. The banisher is his real name. He's a good dude, uh, an Australian wrestler. And I really, I really elbow it, but not from the top rope because so you just can't. I mean, it's so yeah, many yeah. things can go wrong, right? Uh, so anyway, so I, I go up and I do it and I fly and I hit it and it's amazing. Ah, it's amazing. And then the director comes over and he's like, he's like, oh, you want to rehearse it again? You want to? Uh, no, no, no. Let, let, let's shoot it. I want to do it. Chavo looks at me. He's like, it's amazing. He was like, just do this. Left foot on the second rope, right foot on the top rope. Don't stand up until you have your balance. Macho wouldn't even stand up if he didn't have his balance, right? Nobody <laughs> stands up, you know, so it's a dip. And just that tweak of, you know, left foot, right foot up, man. And then I, and I do it. But the director goes, the only note I had, he had is 
he was, I want your eye line to be the camera. And they, so there's this big pet, uh, mat in the middle and the camera on the corner, the cameraman on the ground looking up. So instinctually, I guess, when you're looking at something, same with like driving, you look, yeah. you know, you have it. Uh, so I do it and I, and I fly and, uh, Oh man. I, and instead of landing in the middle of the pad, I land within this, this close from the camera because, you know, I'm looking at the camera. So I guess I wanted to elbow the camera subconsciously. Right. And I flew uh, and, and uh, everybody came running over, like, you're right. Everybody. They thought I hit the camera. Cause he kind of like moved out of the way at the last second, and, but he didn't move out of the way. But when we hit, he, he, you know, he had to move. Uh, anyway, it was amazing. And, and we did it all just right there. That's how good Chavo Guerrero is that he could teach me how to do the, you know, my favorite move of all time in real time. And we shot it. It was amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So. This has been awesome, brother. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciate everything you do. And uh, I love connecting. I, I, I think this is going to be a long-term connection and anything I can do for you. Right. If you're ever in Toronto, I mean, I'd love to take you around and show you around and, and uh, hang out for a bit with you. So thank you for doing this, man. And, and I apologize for last time. So I appreciate you coming back in two Amen. hours, man. This is the longest podcast well, of 140 I've ever done, and we could probably talk on forever. So I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm full of I'm full of hot air, man. You got to shut me up. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, man. That's a wrap for today. I want to thank our guest, Ken, for taking time on his busy schedule to be a guest on the Jeff Nozine podcast. Great conversation. So much fun. This is probably one of the funnest conversations we've had in a while with the gentleman that plays Randy Moshman Savage better than anybody I could ever see. If you guys enjoy this podcast as much as I have, like all weeks, tell your friends, tell your family, spread the word. Let's help build this podcast to the next level. Re leave a review. Five stars would be absolutely amazing. We love spending time with our staff just sitting back and reading the reviews. They actually mean a ton to us. Until next week, guys. Keep moving forward.